the intro is whenever we start, right? Yeah. Matt's <laughs> going to do an official one, though. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of E-commerce Exchange. This is a podcast about e-commerce marketing and this, this month content. Um, really happy to welcome Melanie Diesel. Hi, Melanie. Hey there. Nice to meet you. Um, I'll give you a proper intro and, and some of some of the facts around your history in a moment. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say hello to Lewis as well. Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm good, thank you. We've done this today already, haven't we? At the beginning of the day. Yes. <laughs> um, and that is my intro complete. So now I'm going to do an intro for Melanie. Um, so this is the, <laughs> this is the bit I like doing because it makes me aware of my own lack of achievements in my life thus far. <laughs> so, Melanie, I understand that you interned at Rolling Stone, you worked at HuffPost, the New York Times, you're an expert in residence at Gary Vaynerchuk's Brave Ventures, you wrote a column for Inc.com, you sit on the board of the Native Ad Institute, a member of the MIC chapter of the National Speakers Association, a member of the American Marketing Association and the American Advertising Federation. And you're the director of uh, content at Foundation Marketing and the author of, I think, your first book, is it? The content it is the first. Framework. Yes, uh, which Lewis and I have just read. And it's uh, very, very good. So we'll talk about that today as well. So oh, well done on achieving so many things. Do you, uh, have you got any time spare to watch um, Tiger King or <laughs> is it, yeah, mainly, is I mean, it just we... work? Well, so, you know, uh, luckily I'm not doing all of those things at the same time, thankfully. <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was sort of a progression there. Um, but we also have a 19-month-old toddler at home. So, uh, yeah, life is pretty crazy. But every now and then, late in the night, when, when everything's finally done, we're like, it's time to, time to watch the Netflix. And then usually <laughs> fall asleep about 30 minutes later. <laughs> awesome. Well, I can, I can relate to a certain extent. I've got a four-week-old, so... It's maybe slightly further into the sleep deprivation. Who knows? We can. Oh yeah, you can compete on that later. Hang in there. Hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I suppose the first thing is, uh, I mean, I can see why you produce so much. If you're an expert in residence for Gary Vaynerchuk, then content production is is going to be a huge part of that job. But how, how did the book come about? Can you talk about where that came from and, and the kind of, I suppose, the summary? the book in an eggshell if you can do that sure yeah so the the uh the brave ventures thing uh that ended around 2016 they were actually acquired by turner and so they're no more but it was a, a really fun time for me to be able to go and, and do workshops with all these these huge brands mm -hmm. that were portfolio and partners um but the book was a, a more recent development so i uh i have found that a lot of times when i'm like in meetings with clients or something um, they'll often say, or I often hear like, we don't, you can't come up with good content ideas for us. We're too boring or too regulated or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is my favorite moment of the meeting because like, that's a challenge and I accept it immediately. And so I love kind of throwing out ideas rapid fire. And, uh, that was always something that clients wanted to know, well, how can we do that? How can we get our team to just, you know, rapid fire, come up with content ideas. And I couldn't explain it. I didn't know what I was doing in my own head. And that bothered me a lot. So I spent a lot of time sort of, uh, reflecting and figuring out what is that process that I'm doing mentally and very quickly when I'm, I'm coming up with ideas. And I broke that down into essentially what you have in the book, which is I'm asking those two key questions of, you know, what am I going to focus on? What's like the angle or the, the, perspective we're going to take on this and then what's the best format to bring that to life how are we going to take uh take that and and you know bring it to life in some sort of visual way that our audience can consume yeah i think it's really good i think kind of the, the way we explain it there is so succinct and perfect I've, I've read the book this past couple of weeks and it's um i think it just gives you a good framework to have a, a brainstorming session and then chuck out loads of ideas very quickly um, yeah. And then you can kind of whittle through them and, and kind of boil them down to the, to the real good ones and, and put it into your content calendar and then schedule some stuff. So, yeah, really, really exactly. Good. Yeah. Well, and I think for me, the idea was really about volume because sometimes people ask, well, like, what if I come up with ideas that aren't good? Well, that, that's fine. We all do that. Um, but one of the things that's really important is to kind of rid yourself of that scarcity mindset that like, no, I can't come up with ideas. I'm not creative. I don't have it. You know, that kind of mindset is just not going to be helpful in a creative environment. So 
to come up with a lot and not care necessarily whether they're all usable or whether you can schedule them all or whether you have the resources for all of them. It just kind of gets your brain. It, it's, it's practicing that process of coming up with a lot of ideas and figuring out later what will work. So I just think it's, it's nice to have volume to work with. You know, it's easier to select a, a good piece from, from a list of 10 than, you know, go with the one you, you thought of first. I think the other thing to add to that as well is that, you know, you're not, some people might be, but most people aren't producing, you know, a New York Times or, or a Guardian piece that's kind of imprinted somewhere and then goes out and, and you have no control over it. Most content is so ephemeral these days that even if you do do a bad piece of content, pretty much the worst thing that can happen is that it gets largely ignored <laughs> and yeah. people well, move on. Yeah, well, and I, I like to talk about that in terms of, you know, other industries as well, because there's bad music, there's bad mm -hmm. food, there's bad TV, like there's bad everything. It's just, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Mm. Somebody's going to make it. So, um, you know, it's not really a signal that content doesn't work. It's not a signal that it's not worth it. It's not, you know, a signal of you're failing as a marketer. Mm. It's just that's the reality. Like that stuff's going to happen sometimes. You just got to yeah. pick it up and, and move on. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned. <laughs> Sorry, Max. Sorry. I was just going to say there's something in the book that resonated with me um, where you said there's so much content everywhere. It's kind of overwhelming and that sometimes you, you kind of have a purge. And I, I've, I've done that recently where I've gone through my Spotify. You know, I've got 25 podcasts on there that I want to listen to. And each of those podcasts has got 2000 episodes. And I worked out that I, I have to I'd have to live for, for about 300 years to get through the stuff that's already in there. <laughs> so I think that that means that you have to be. Yeah, you are a lot of there's potential for stuff to get ignored, which is fine. Um, but you, your stuff has to be really good in order to cut through all that noise and to yeah um, to be to be noticed. Which is I think why the, that structure is very helpful to help you get to what is really going to resonate with your audience. Yeah, really, that, uh, that bit I read that bit as well, and it really struck me as well because we've been having this conversation about games and books and TV, yeah. and it's just there's there is too much out there. And aside from just the fear of missing out on stuff, which I think is the biggest driver for consuming content. I yeah. just, I don't, I don't want to have to choose between all of that. I yeah, well, the there's, there's definitely decision fatigue. I mean, that's, that's one of the challenges I think a lot of us face from a content standpoint, just like you said, if there's too many episodes that are backed up, there's no, I'm never going to catch up. So what's the point, right? It can mm. kind of exhaust us. Um, and that's why I think it's nice to, to kind of just start fresh. If the stuff is good and you want to find it, you'll find it again. Um, you know, it'll make its way to you. Um, this is one thing that, that I found worked really well for me. I am a collector of books. I love, love to read. Um, but like many people who also have a lot of books, uh, most of them I haven't read. They're, they're sort of the optimistic, uh, you know, idealized like, oh yes, I'm going to read all of these books. Um, mm -hmm. And then what happens is I look at the bookshelf and there's so many books that I want to read that I haven't read. I can't, I can't choose one. I have, it's again, that decision fatigue. So what I've found is I've actually been do, using audiobooks, and that's so much easier for me because I pick them one at a time. It's sort of like a content bankruptcy. My list of what to read is much, much shorter. Um, and so it makes it easier for me to, to work my way through things because I'm only, you know, I'm sort of choosing one at a time. Yeah. You talked, you talked earlier about um, the, the, the kind of approach to content and people often view, not just content, but everything, because there's a scarcity with creativity. And yeah. Possibly that you need to work from a place more of abundance than scarcity. Um, but do you, the, the other thing is that people often view creativity as something that is other than you. It's like, if you're not a creative person, naturally, if you're an analytical person or, or whatever that might be, creativity, yeah. whatever that is deemed as doesn't come naturally to you. You say, well, that's not for me. That's for other people. I can't make music like that. I can't produce content yeah. like that. Do you view it as a muscle that, that just needs to be used? And the more you do it, you get better at it. Yeah, hundred percent. So the thing that's really interesting is there's a lot of data that shows that we are all innately, insanely curious. If you look at mm -hmm. any child, a niece, nephew, a child in your life, or think back to when you were younger, I mean, we told stories and drew pictures of the craziest things. Like this is my brother being carried off by a dragon to go to bubblegum, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, cloud party or something. I just made that up. But, you know, we, we don't have any reservations. We just, we are very, very creative. And what happens, the data shows is that over time, as we become adults and we learn what it's like to be in society and have two-way conversations and all of that, 
we're sort of conditioned to keep that stuff in. And if you don't do it all the time, you're not going to remember how to do it. You know, it's not going to come naturally. So it's definitely about sort of reawakening that part of your brain that we know is there and we know is active, but it's sort of got a silencer on it. And so we just kind of want to break that shell and, and let it out. Um, so yeah, I think that that, that kind of exercise lets you tap into that so much easier. And I, I gotta be honest, I feel like it's a much nicer way to live when you have that um, because it allows you to see more productive solutions. It allows you to, to find fun and joy in places that you might not otherwise, um, you know, you can connect with other people because you can get equally excited about their passions when you're creatively thinking about how it might work in other ways. So I don't know, I, I, think, we, I think we'd all be a little, a little happier if we could uh, unlock that area sooner. I mean, you said you made the story up about your brother being carried off by a dragon, but yeah. it sounds like when you were younger, you were writing, was it a book about a fairy? You were definitely <laughs> producing content uh, at a young yeah. age. I, I definitely was. So I don't have a brother. So that wasn't a, a real story that I that Well, because he's been carried um, off by a dragon. That's why. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I definitely used to do that like a lot. My mom, uh, I think I mentioned this in the book, actually. Uh, my mom used to tease me that when I was little, one of my hobbies was I'm making books. That was like my version of, you know, riding my bike or doing crafts or something. I would fold the paper and I would like make these dramatic, I don't know, like fictional tales or, or dramatic retellings of things in my life, you know, thoroughly embellished, whatever I, I came up with. So, yeah, it's, I, I've been a creator since I guess before that was a buzzword, but we all are really. Yeah, I, was in, I was kind of interested in your writing process as well. I'm always interested in people who can write and write well and and kind of see it through. I mean, Lewis and I have attempted writing, haven't we, Lewis? This is the first time yeah. we're going public with this. But during <laughs> lockdown, one of our um, we, we kind of got together and, we, and we, we set each other briefs and we tried to, to do some creative writing just to just as a bit of an outlet. And the, the thing that became apparent for me was just how difficult it actually is to not just sit down and, and kind of put that time aside and do it but to then put anything good out um and I, I know you had you had a bit of an enforced deadline didn't you when you were doing your book yeah yeah um, so when I was writing my book I was pregnant so I had to get that book done uh, before the baby came that was a nice deadline for sure <laughs> <laughs> um and what was your did you find that the routine was the way to do it? So you would just sit down for X amount of time per day and bosh out some words. What was your kind of approach? So that I think I'm, I might be different in that regard. I know a lot of people um, swear by that sort of daily writing and they do it at the same time in the same place every day. Um, I really like novelty. Novelty helps me think more creatively. So what I actually did was kind of go around and work in different coffee shops. This was, you know, the pre-COVID days. So um, I would, I literally had like a, a checklist of different coffee shops in my area. I would go and find one. I'd sit down for a day or however long I was able to, and I'd pump out, you know, 3000, 5,000, whatever, however many words I could. Um, and then the next day I just go at it again. Um, but I did learn some, some helpful tricks along the way. So, uh, if you really want to get it done, I think it's very important for you to have a complete picture of what you want that work to look like. If, if it's nonfiction, um, especially like what am I trying to achieve? How am I trying to help people? What do I need to show them in order to achieve that? Like I had a very clear outline from the beginning. So it made sitting down and writing, I already knew what I needed to write. I didn't have to think of what to write, you know? So that was very, very helpful. The other thing that I heard as a suggestion, I can't remember from where, but it did wonders for me is stop in the middle of a sentence. And I know that sounds really dumb, but the next time you open your laptop and there's a half complete sentence and you can start typing right away to finish it, it just starts you with your momentum so much faster than staring at a blank screen and trying to figure out what's next. Um, that maybe it's a little hack. I don't know if it works for everybody, but it definitely worked for me. Um, so that, that half sentence trick, I think made, made me a little more productive on a lot of days. <laughs> so did you, did you find that, um, and one of the things that, this we discovered through the kind of writing process is that actually the majority of the work is not really done in the initial in the initial writing so much of it is the edit and the you know redrafting and redrafting like how much of that was the process of the book for you so for me it actually was more the writing process um 
I would say the editing process is a little more, more stressful often or painful for people mm -hmm. because, you know, you have to really look at yourself critically and, you know, take feedback from other people is sometimes difficult, um, especially, you know, it's your ideas. So it can feel really personal when someone says like, that's a dangling modifier. You need to, you know, change that sentence or something. You're like, oh, I'm a failure as a human. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's hard not to take it personally. So I think it's a more like emotional, stressful experience to be edited. Um, but for me, uh, really luckily, I, um, I, I actually did my, my master's degree in arts and cultural editing. And so uh, I was really lucky to know that I generally produce pretty clean copy and I, I edit myself pretty well. So um, our editing process didn't take a long time. It was just, you know, as always. And, you know, I was hopped up on, on hormones when they were uh, giving me all that feedback. So maybe, maybe <laughs> I was a little sensitive, to be honest. <laughs> I like that. It's, uh, I think may maybe if... If we can have a baby and then start writing the book at the beginning, I'd have to, if I have another baby, start writing the book at the beginning and then just enforce that deadline. I don't know if there's, um, I don't know what the cost benefit is on that. Depends how successful the book is, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I wrote the book in about <laughs> under three months. Oh, wow. Is how long it took me to write the book. Um, but again, I, I was really blessed that I was able to spend my days doing that you know um I had some some consulting clients but I wasn't like working in nine to five and having to do this mm -hmm. on nights and weekends um I was really in a privileged place to be able to make my own schedule and, and focus on that for a good amount of time awesome um and just just to go back to the um I suppose the, the marketing side of this because I, I feel like content marketing as a thing was kind of rolled out when HubSpot started producing software and you know, it was kind of made famous by software like HubSpot, which which essentially just allows you to maybe distribute and gate content more effectively at its very basis. Yeah. But then you, I don't know, look at the guys at Content Marketing Institute and, and the stuff they're talking about, and they're going, well, actually, content marketing came with the printing press and before. Like, it's a really old... Um, you know it's a really old piece of uh, piece of kind of tactic I suppose yeah and it's existed for a very long time um so so what's your kind of view of that how much are you in the, the history of content marketing versus you know uh, where do you kind of stand on that because it's definitely not a new thing but people definitely no. viewed it as the new silver bullet tactic sure I mean I think there was a time right around uh like 20. 13, I feel like was the real sweet mm -hmm. spot where every publisher was making their own content studio, you know, HuffPost partner studio and Buzzfeed partner studio, you know, everybody mm -hmm. was spinning up these brand content teams and same thing within brands. Um, that was definitely sort of a, a moment where it was having, it was having its moment. It was the shiny new mm -hmm. thing um, just in terms of awareness. Uh, but I think that, I think, that, I mean, it's been around for so long. I think the real difference is that, and this is true with, with most things in marketing, the barrier to entry is a lot smaller now that we have all these mm. digital tools available. When you look at those early examples, even like back a hundred years ago, when John Deere created the furrow, which was their, you know, their regular magazine. I mean, making a magazine is an act like there are separate whole companies that make a magazine. Like mm -hmm. that's a big enterprise to design and lay out and get a print. I mean, that's a lot. So when we're talking about the difference between that level of lift and writing a blog post once a week, it's so much easier now. So I think that's what we were seeing is sort of the awakening that like, we can do this. We don't, we can do this much easier than we would have been able to do 20, 50, a hundred years ago. Um, but yeah, anytime, anytime someone talks about like whether, uh, whether it's a new thing, I always like to remind them that uh, the Michelin stars that restaurants yeah. get comes from Michelin tires. They wanted people to, to do things that were within driving distance, wear out their tires and, and you yeah. know, need, need tires. So, I mean, it definitely I was, works. Yeah, I was just about to talk about that one because I think there's, there's often you lose that connection of you, you, you almost think you were talking earlier about some industries saying we, we can't produce content because we're too boring. Like we make, yeah. uh, I don't know, conveyor belts or something, <laughs> but you almost have to take two or three steps out of that. Um, you know, most people don't make the connection between Michelin and, and the fact that Michelin just wanted people to drive more. And so they rated restaurants uh, around the world to encourage people to, to, to drive and therefore use their tires more and therefore buy Michelin. And when they came to buy tires, Michelin would be front of mind. You know, there's only a couple of steps really there in between the actual, yeah. the content production and, and the core of it. So it really is open to anyone, right? Anyone can, you've just got to find where that is. Yeah, 100%. So I think what happens sometimes is we get 
so focused on needing to talk about our product that we forget about those like half step or one step away opportunities that can sometimes be much more engaging. So a lot of times we hear this with products that people might consider like taboo or embarrassing, anything related to like sexual wellness or, you know, feminine hygiene. They say, well, we can't, we can't make content about that. People don't want to engage in that. Well, it's not really about those things. It's about feeling confident. It's about feeling connected to a partner. It's about, you know, all, all these other things that are a half step away. And so I think in a lot of cases, whether you're, you know, in a, in a taboo industry in a heavily regulated industry in a, um, you know, a boring industry, we hear that all the time at foundation that, that B2B uh, SaaS is like, it has to be boring. And it, it just doesn't, you just have to take a step back from the product and think more about some of the ancillary things. What's the role that it plays in your customer's life? What emotion does it make them feel? How can we make it easier for them to understand the world that we live in? How can we teach them something that makes their life easier? Like if you can ask those questions from half a step back or a full step back, you're going to see so many more opportunities. Yeah. The example, the example we always use is the old, I can never remember who to, to credit it to, but the people, people aren't buying a quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole. And then you take that a step further and you say, well, are they putting up a shelf? What? Are they, yeah. are they, what are they putting on the shelf? You know, why are they doing those things? And then, and then how far can you go? And suddenly you can get from a drill to here's our bookshelf recommendations. You know, here's a book club. You know what I mean? There's yeah. those connections that you can make quite easily. And it's people still forget the, the principles of marketing, I think haven't changed for a long time because no. it's, it's a human to human thing. The tactics have changed and people say, oh, we need to be on Facebook now. We need to be on Instagram now or TikTok or yeah. Clubhouse or whatever the new thing is. But fundamentally, the, pr the principles are the same and it's a solution to a problem, right? That's what people yeah. are searching for almost always. B2B, B2C, it doesn't matter. A hundred percent. So and that, that is sorry, on. go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, that's exactly why in the book too, I wanted to make sure we focus on our focus. Like what is the actual story first before we think about the format because formats are going to come and go like I mean how much effort was put into Vine before that disappeared right or musically before TikTok came along and wiped it away Meerkat mm. Periscope like these these formats are going to come and go these platforms are going to come and go so you really want to make sure that you're putting your effort on understanding like you said your story what is it that we're trying to share what is our mission what is what are our values if you're clear on that, you can then place that in any kind of format or environment, but you have to be super clear on that first. Yeah. You, you, talk, you talk quite a lot about, um, you know, the, the kind of different formats and uh, producing multiple pieces of content from single piece of content. There's lots, lots of different kind of variations of that around manifesto content into multiple pieces below that. What's your kind of process for going about that, um, just, just broadly speaking? Uh, so, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of opportunity, I think, from a repurposing standpoint, I think a lot of us are missing really easy opportunities to to just repurpose our content into another format. So what mm -hmm. I mean by that is, you know, we're here recording, we're recording on video, but this is also going to be shared, I presume, as an audio only experience. It might also be appearing as a written blog experience, summarizing the best points. I assume at some point there might be a graphic for social that shares uh, a quote from the from the from our conversation. So that's one core piece of content. We're recording this conversation here, but we're seeing multiple ways to share that and distribute it. And so I think yeah. that's a big missed opportunity. Like, never mind making more content. Like, do more with the content you already have. Distribute mm -hmm. that content in more ways and in more places. Um, but there's also an opportunity when you have one really good idea uh, to kind of multiply that and turn it into many good ideas. Um, mm -hmm. I call them multipliers in the book, but an example would be changing uh, the time that applies to a piece. So for example, you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, the drilling a hole, right? So that we're gonna do bookshelf recommendations. Um, bookshelves you can build in, in one hour, bookshelves you can build in two hours, bookshelves you can build in three hours. Like there's gonna be a market for people looking for that piece of content in, in different time spans, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think books, if you're making book recommendations as well, you got the, the best new books of April, the best new books of May, the best new books of, you know, you can go on and on uh, of the fall of the whole year, uh, best books to give as a gift at Christmas time. Like just by looking at time as a potential differ differentiator, you can take that one idea and sort of expand the web from it of related content. Um, you might not create all of them, but again, it gives you volume to work with to say, yeah. are there other variations here 
uh, that would appeal to the same audience and give us the same opportunity. So vo volumes, I think, uh, I think there's two, there's two sides to the volume thing. There was a long time where people were just saying we need to produce more content and people took a step back and said, actually, we don't need to be producing more. We need to be producing better content. And I think there's, there's now like a, you know, probably a balance between the two or there's certainly a scale, maybe on the Gary V end where it's like we're producing hundreds of pieces of content a day and there's a team around me that do that versus people are saying, yeah. actually, I just produce one you know long form piece of content and then that's split down in, in various different ways but the, the volume thing I was I was really interested in your just shift of perception about if I was to say to you name a hundred cities the three or four different ways that you, you know you might be able to approach that because you go a oh, hundred cities is a lot but then you talk about actually you could just start with the cities you've lived in and then the cities that are near the cities you've lived in or, you know, you talked about America naming the, the, the state capitals. So how did you kind of, where did the kind of shift in perception about volume of content come for you? So I, I don't know that I can really identify. I think one of the things that I'm really lucky is that I studied journalism. And so mm -hmm. it never, it never really stuck in my head that content ideas were a thing that were hard to come by, right? Because especially when I started, I was in newspapers and like, it's got to come out every day and there's a whole bunch yeah. of sections and we don't get to just say, sorry, we couldn't think of anything like come back tomorrow. Um, so it, honestly, it just never occurred to me that, that folks who may have had a different educational background or experience would see them as a, you know, as an endangered species, I guess. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what's happened more often is I'm having to help people who are trying to come to that realization. And I think examples like that tend to be really helpful. Um, like the name cities, what I tell people is you notice you always go to a framework, right? If I asked you to name foods, you would start with vegetables and then do breakfast cereals and then do fruits, like you'd have categories. And so that's why having a framework for your content idea generation is so helpful because if you don't have any framework and you're just trying to arbitrarily come up with ideas, it will certainly be hard. It's like trying to pull something out of thin air. So even if it's not, you know, the content fuel framework that ends up working for you, having some sort of system uh, to guide your thinking is is the easiest way to, to be more productive on that front. It's, it's interesting to me that you reverse engineered almost the, the framework. You, you you built a framework around your own thinking. I did a similar thing with, um, you know, a customer journey framework where I understood that or I'd seen other frameworks and didn't think, you know, it, it didn't quite fit what I was doing or how I approached yeah. things and then built a framework around that. Do you think there's, do you think there's a risk that people get too, even with content fuel or any framework, did they get too tied into it and they never kind of branch out of the, the bounds of that? I mean, I think that, the, you know, your, your journey will kind of guide you there. And I know that sounds very woo woo, but like if you're in a brainstorm and you feel like this is limiting, I've got ideas outside of this. And like, by all means, break down that barrier and, and you know, ideate outside of that space. That's totally mm -hmm. fine. I would love for people to do that. One of my, my favorite things is sometimes people will, will send me an email or something or, you know, a tweet or something and say, well, what about this format? You didn't include that in the book. And I'm like, I didn't. You're right. There's so many others. Like, <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, like, that's awesome. I love that. Uh, I can't list them all, you know? So I think that honestly, like, that's where the real breakthrough happens for some people, I think, is to realize, like, I can make this system work for me, whether that means adding things or taking things away this is like a starter for you and you can adapt it to fit your style of work um, and you know, your scope, your resources and, and what's going to make sense for you and your audience. Yeah. I mean, Twitter is definitely the place for people to tell you what you've missed. I think so. <laughs> I don't think you're on your own there. But I, I, it really doesn't bother me. I, I wish I could say it did, but like I had to stop writing at some point. So, you know, yeah, there's bound course. to be stuff that wasn't covered. And I, I mm. like that. That means people are really thinking critically, right? Yeah, I also think that's a, it's a good just kind of rule of thumb for all content is that you can get a little bit bogged down in saying this is not finished. And then, you know, there has to be a point where you say you just kind of ship it. Same with, you know, they talk about this in products. It's like if if, if you're not yeah. embarrassed by the first thing that went out, then you didn't do it right. You need to you need to push yeah. it a bit more quickly. Um, so, so what's the kind of what's the biggest what's the biggest I understand this, but there's probably not data to back this up. But what's the biggest kind of mistake that you see or biggest misnomer that you see in content marketing at the moment? I think there's there's two options here. I think for folks who are, um, maybe they've been doing content for a little while 
uh, and they're deciding that it's not working without any attempt at you know approaching it from a different lens or updating their strategy. I think we do see a lot of like, I tried that one time and it didn't work kind of mentality. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me of like when you have like a, a younger kid who's like riding a bike or something and they're like, no, I fell. I'm never getting on my bike again. And you're like, you gotta, you gotta keep going. It takes a little time to, to learn. Um, so same thing with content. We sometimes see that kind of burnout. Um, and the other one, which is what we already talked about. I think there's too many people who just think like, this isn't for me. This isn't for our business. It doesn't work in our industry. Like it, I promise you it does like mm. call me up. We'll, we'll figure it out. Like it, it definitely works in every industry. And every, you know, every product type, there's, there's a way to connect with your audience through storytelling, through education, through sharing your story and your history. Uh, you just have to, you just have to figure out the right approach for you and your resources. Yeah, this, this, this seems to be, um, there seems to be a lot of people that, that say content doesn't work or, you know, that it's not for them, or, you know, we're direct to consumer. We're not, we're not business to business. Um, I think in some cases they just, don't know how to define what success is for content and also they they treat everything like it's a, an instant transactional like well this this doesn't deliver as much as paid social does so therefore we're yeah. gonna just so how, how do you how do you view success of, of content marketing how are you measuring that these days yeah of course so i mean i like to categorize content into one of three broad categories and you know there's lots of systems for this the one that i use is to say is this for awareness wherein our goal is to get this in front of as many eyeballs as possible um, in which case we're going to measure eyeballs in whatever capacity that is on the platform where we're sharing. Um, is this for engagement where we want people to, to spend time with this content, to engage with this content in some way within the content environment? So that might be clicking, it might be filling out a form, whatever it is, uh, you know, time on page, time on site, scroll depth, whatever you can measure. Uh, related to that piece of content, or is it for conversion? In which case, the the KPI is usually predefined for us. We want someone to schedule an appointment, download, sign up, subscribe, you know, make a purchase, uh, of course. So I think knowing that upfront, like I will not have a strategy conversation with anyone unless we've had a goals conversation first, because if we don't know, like you, like you said, if we don't know what we're trying to achieve, then we'll never know if we achieved it. So we, we've got to start with that goal and getting clear on what role does this play in our broader business strategy and, and how can we, uh, how can we look to content to be an arm of a full, you know, a full strategy rather than thinking it's going to be the, the one size fits all solution for all of our marketing problems. Yeah. I think it's so good to, to I always love it when people talk about strategy. That's, that's the bit of marketing I love. And so often you have conversations with people where they say, we, we don't need the strategy. We know, we know what we want to do. We just need someone to help us to do it. And then you get into the questions about what they want to do. And actually you, you discover that they don't. And I think yeah. absolutely right. The first question in any conversation about marketing, regardless of the tactic, whether you're calling it content marketing or paid marketing is, what do you want to achieve? Otherwise we, like if, if you just want to get eyeballs, then it's a completely different tactic to, you know, a super transactional. We just want to, we just want to drive conversions. And in both of those conversations, you still have to do the other and consider the other bits. There's a bit of a yeah. Jenga tower of things that happen there just because you don't want to consider awareness. You mm -hmm. can't have transactions without the awareness first. You know what I mean? If you don't right. build that foundation, you'll eventually yeah. run out of people to look at, look at, look at your That's stuff. right. Yeah, for sure. Nice. Um, Matt, have you got any more questions you want to go over? I was, I was kind of interested in the, the, the way that kind of people consume content and how that's maybe evolved over the past probably decade or so. I, I think this is a personal point of view from working with lots of 20 year olds. But I think that <laughs> I can see Melanie's <laughs> going, oh no, this is going to be, this is so anecdotal. It's not, there's go. nothing to back no, this I've got, up. I've got no, data. I like it. I've got data. I like it. Now, I think that <laughs> attention spans have just dropped through the floor. And I, so I, I find it quite frustrating. Sometimes if I'm writing a, you know, a 1500 word blog piece or something, and I'm, I'm a question, you know, is anyone going to be engaged enough to, to read all the way through this? And I know part of that might be, it's my job to make it engaging to do that. Um, <laughs> But I wonder if you if you see an evolution of the way that people consume that content and, you know, across social media and stuff and what your views on that are, really. Yeah, I mean, I, the what I do know is that the whole like we have the attention span of a goldfish thing has has been thoroughly debunked. 
Um, my my main uh, point of, of reference for that, you mentioned Tiger King earlier. I mean, how many hours of content is that about a guy who who is the Tiger King, right? And people watched it. So, you know, what about Game of Thrones? We're talking about two hour long episodes every single week. People don't have an attention problem. It's a quality problem. It's, it's what content is actually adding value to their life and the fact that they have so many options now. So your blog post is competing with Tiger King. Like your blog post is, well, not anymore, but competing with Game of Thrones, right? Like those are, I mean, those are, that's the reality, right? And I know that that's kind of cliche to say we're competing for everyone's attention, but that's the reality. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times if someone's not engaging with the content in the way that you want and you feel like it's an attention problem, sometimes maybe that needs to be in a different format. Maybe it needs to be a, a slideshow that people can click through and that will keep their attention better or Maybe it should have been an infographic because that would be a more engaging way to engage with a, a data focused piece. Um, but I think you're hundred percent right about how quickly, uh, you know, our, our consumption patterns change because uh, I was reading something recently. I was, you know, proofing a piece of content for, for someone and, and it's someone younger and they they had a sentence that said, Facebook is no longer just the place to catch up with your grandma. And I had a realization of like, I've seen the full arc, like, Remember, Facebook was only for college kids. And then you hated that your mom was on it. Then there were grandparents. And like, now it's having, it, it's, they see that as the starting point. And like, to me, that was the full, you know, arc. And so it was just, it's funny to see how quickly the perception changes and the way we, you know, we get content. I, I love the way that I feel like when, when I was growing up, like blogging was a really big thing. We were just kind of getting into the early days of like people setting up a live journal or a blogger or whatever. And so I felt empowered to write all the time. Now I look at the, the young kids now and like they're freaking video producers. Like if there's, there's eight year olds who can edit like some of the most fantastic videos I've seen. And like, I, it, I think that's amazing, right? Like the, the technology that we have is, is giving us skills that are actually useful in life. Like we use those things down the line all the time. So I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's just, it, you know, change is hard. We, we don't like it. <laughs> The, the other thing is you talked about multi multi format content or taking this like there is you know there will be a section of people that will sit and watch this video on their second screen mainly just me and you matt but there will be other people uh and you know they will watch the whole thing as a video piece or you know there'll be other people that listen to the full thing but it'll be on the version podcast through spotify and then you know the other people will just be watching the 30 second clips that we put out on social so right. you have to kind of produce for those different mindsets, right? A hundred percent. And the analogy I like to make here is, you know, imagine COVID is gone. So we're taking that variable out. You're going to have a get together this weekend or, or next weekend. And you're going to invite a mix of people from your life, coworkers, family, friends, every one of those people, you know, would prefer to be invited in a different way. Like older folks, they're not on Facebook. So you just, you need to send them something in the mail. Like I got to send you an actual invitation. That's how I know you'll come. Some people you need to text. Some people you need to send them a Google calendar invite or else they're not going to show up, right? There's, there's different ways that we understand. Everyone wants to come to this party, uh, but I need to invite them in different ways because that's what's going to work for them. And so that's how I like to think about distribution. It's not that we're sort of distilling our whole party down to a text message, which you could see it like disdainfully when you're taking your article and turning it into a tweet, right? But actually I am taking this piece and taking someone who would never see it otherwise and giving them uh, a starting point to, to make their way in. Uh, and so I, I like to think of it as like, who are we inviting to the party and, and how can we best invite them? Like it. I've never had to invite that many people to a party that it's been a problem. <laughs> I don't think that might be more of a reflection of the life that I've led. <laughs> no, this was this was super interesting. Is there anything? What questions should we have asked that we haven't, Melanie? I don't realize hmm. I'm making you do our job here, but <laughs> no, that's a that's a good one. I like that one. And, and they teach you in journalism school. You always ask that one last because that sometimes oh. the best stuff comes up. Ah. Um, so, so I should you have know, gone to journalism right school. There. <laughs> there you go. Maybe, maybe you already did. So let's see. Um, I can't think of anything that's super important from a strategic standpoint that we didn't cover. Um, I could talk for a whole day about some of the topics we covered. So just like with the book, there's bound to be stuff we didn't cover. Um, yeah. But I hope that any of those those curiosity gaps that someone finds when they're listening to us here 
starts them on a journey to go and, and learn more about that thing, to, to go read a blog post or watch a video or find an expert or whatever else. Uh, so, you know, if there's anything you didn't learn here, any open questions, then consider this your permission to, to dig in and learn more about that. Yeah. I mean, everyone should go out and buy um, the audiobook or, or read by you, like I said at the beginning before before we started recording. Very, yeah. very well done for recording that. It's a <laughs> it's a challenge. Everyone should go out and buy the book. Um, get the audio book because I'm, I'm I'm older, so I bought the physical book. Mm. And you you're younger, and you listen to the book. <laughs> See, yeah, my hairline is happens. certainly older than yours, though. So I don't know whether that's. <laughs> Um, no, but the book is great, and I think it's 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 so helpful to have something that just you know the, the framework thing. There's lots of frameworks, lots of different things out there. And I think the other thing that's worth saying to people is content. I know we touched on this is an element of a marketing suite, right? It is part of the whole right. marketing suite, and um, companies that sell content marketing software clearly want you to think that it is the be all and end all. But you know, there's lots of stuff that goes into that and, and there's there's lots of other things to consider so the strategic element should always consider content but it should always consider the other stuff as well and also yeah. that anyone can do it right direct consumer yeah no matter i what like to are. i like to think of content as like a sprinkle of salt like it, it can make any meal more delicious that doesn't mean you want to eat a whole spoonful by itself uh that's so better <laughs> when combined with uh, a lot of other ingredients i like it um superb thanks so much for your time if people want to find out more about you <laughs> Um, where do they go? So if you want to find out more about what me and my team are up to at Foundation Marketing and how we're helping B2B and SaaS companies uh, make better content and distribute it strategically, that's at foundationinc.co. Um, if you want to learn more about me, you can just go to melaniediesel.com or find me on LinkedIn or whatever uh, whatever platform suits your fancy. I'm, I'm always there and, and uh, I'm usually the only one, so you'll find me like it it'll be linked in the description as well of course there we go we pointed down because that's where the description will be. i'm gonna i'm gonna edit it above now <laughs> uh, thanks. yeah i mean you shouldn't this is a you've what you've done is you've left it open for us to just put any comments that we want now <laughs> in, in that tiktok style video it's true. i was thinking the the quote melanie did about the quote will be the quote I thought that'd be quite nice and meta, you know. And the quote about the quote. The quote, about the quote really. At some point, you're going to create a quote of this conversation, and that would be. <laughs> <laughs> so, Melanie, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully, we'll hear more from you again soon. For sure, it's been fun. Let me know how. I